Well, welcome everybody. And uh, uh, my name is Kevin Stevens. I'm the editorial director for Imagine Publishing, which is part of the Charles Bridge Group. Um, we're based in Massachusetts. I'm delighted today to have uh, two authors, two of my favorite authors, um, Joni Detjen and Kelly Watson, who are um, authors of The Next Smart Step, How to Overcome Gender Stereotypes and Build a Stronger Organization, which is a book that's already out in its e-form. Uh, so it's uh, in the market and will be out in print uh, in, on February 9th of, uh, of next year. So it's a book we're very excited about, uh, a book that, um, that I really enjoyed working on and really became engaged with and uh, really pleased to, to, to have uh, you guys with us today. Just like to say a word or two about Jody and, and Kelly. They, they are accomplished organizational development consultants, educators, and they are managing partners of Orange Grove Consulting, which is a consultancy firm that specializes in helping organizations improve gender equity and inclusivity through a set of consulting tools and training programs. And gender equity is, you know, the subject that is at the heart of this book and, and, uh, and that, that uh, forms the, 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 the subject for today's talk. Um, Jody and Kelly together have designed top tier women's leadership training for clients in, across the world and consulted for a wide range of organizations and um, are the previous authors of co-authors of The Orange Line, A Woman's Guide to Integrating Career, Family and Life. So <clears throat> welcome both of you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jody, perhaps I'd like to start with you and sure. uh, ask you to talk a little bit about, you know, the genesis of this book, how you decided on its focus and talk a little bit about gender equity in general and the roles of women and men, uh, that the roles that women and men really have to take in order to make it a reality. Yeah, so it's, this all started with our first book, which you mentioned, The Orange Line, and Kelly and I were really kind of frustrated with the lack of progress that women, of women getting women into senior leadership. And so we started, we did the research and we found in our first book that really there was a lot of these external stereotypes and belief systems that women had internalized that was holding back their career. So, we, you know, fast forward a couple of years and we've been doing a lot of work with organizations around how do you bring more women into senior leadership? We've done tons of, we've trained thousands of managers and women in, in our methodology and approach to really give them some, a, a way of getting past this bias. And, but we kept hearing over and over again was that organizations didn't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what the problem was. And then we also were talking to men and hearing a lot of stereotypes that they had internalized about what it means to be a man in our society. And so we th looked at this whole picture and we're like, we need to give people a roadmap. We need to give people some tools and ideas to get out of this mess that we're in. And because what we heard from companies is, well, let's go fuss out the problem. We'll throw some stuff up on the wall. You know, we'll send a thousand women off to training and we're done. And of course, that's not what happened because the numbers don't change. And so what we really looked at with this book was how do we help organizations move forward and really think of this as a strategy. You'll hear us talk about this a lot in the next bit that we're talking about, but from a strategic and operational perspective. So it becomes mm -hmm. extremely practical. So I think when we talk about it in this book, it's like the why, the what, and the how. Mm -hmm. We really try to give the whole picture. You asked about gender equity, um, and I know we're gonna talk about the COVID implications in a little bit, but the reality is, is that in leadership, we are still in the same place that we've been. When we started researching this back in 2004, and we look back to this date, that data, it's not changed that much. Um, we're still, in, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's pretty much every industry. So for example, even in nonprofit, which is predominantly female, you see mostly men in senior leadership. And so, you know, in terms of gender equity and the roles that women have to take, I think there's still a lot of embedded structural and systemic blocks and barriers. And so we really try to address that directly in the book and show the way out. Yeah. And I, lo I love how the audience for this book is not narrow. It is men, it is women, it is organizations, it's leaders, it's people on the ladder to leadership, it's new entrants. It's, it's, it's very much a global audience. And, 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 and Kelly, maybe you can talk a little bit about Orange Grove Consulting and, you know, how that shaped your approach, how the, you know, on the ground work that you guys have done for so long has shaped your approach to this book. Yeah, well, like Jody said, you know, w when we started working with organizations, 
we were doing women's leadership development training and a lot of the approach was, well, if women aren't in leadership, it's certainly a problem that they have. And so we need to fix the women and we'll, we'll do some training. And, and we certainly have um, helped a lot of women, thousands of women overcome their own internal stereotypes and the things that have been barriers for them. You know, their perfectionism, their constant focus on getting the tasks done instead of doing some of the more strategic work at the bigger picture. So, um, so that, that was sort of our, our way in, and that was based on the research we did in our first book. But what we kept, like Jody said, we kept hearing from the organization, well, there's also, there's not just stuff that women are doing or things that are under their control, but there are things around them in the environment that are also sticky, that are, that are keeping them down. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's interesting, it's natural for us, our background is organizational consulting, so we we're used to taking processes apart and finding where the, the problems are. And, and this was really just the same thing. It's looking at the entire pipeline from the moment you decide you want to hire a new person and, and create a job description that may or may not have language that directs what gender you have envisioned, you know, for that role, all the way through the pipeline, who gets, you know, the um, informal extra meetings, extra attention, extra hands up, you know, gets brought into the accounts, you know, who, who's socializing on the golf course and, and gets that introduction. And we found that there were so many of these sort of um, processes along the way, all the way through, even role modeling. You know, if, if, if the only folks you have at the top of your organization all have the exact same career path and the exact same lifestyle, meaning that it's a, it's a white male with a stay-at-home wife, um, and they got there by working, you know, 60, 70 hours a week and traveling and running different divisions. And then you've got women trying to, you know, kind of come up and, and through, through lots of reasons of their own, don't feel like they fit into that role model, then they self-select out. And so it has nothing to do. You can train them all you want and you can remove barriers, but that's an unspoken, the role modeling itself is an unspoken barrier. So so we, by taking apart all of these processes all the way through, and, and we, we introduce this in the book, the concept of a scorecard. So mm -hmm. we can look at the dimensions all the way through and at different levels, because one of the most common things we hear with organizations is that we have a lot of women at the bottom. You know, we're, we're more than 50-50. You know, we, we've got a 50-50 balance at the bottom. You get into middle management, we start to see it drop off. But really, it's that step between middle management and senior management. And so we can actually really pinpoint, instead of throwing programs at the wall and spaghetti and saying, oh, what's going to stick? We can pinpoint exactly where the problem is so that we can focus resources there. And it's not about training the entire company on unconscious bias. It may be about this division in this particular segment, in this particular step that the women are trying to take. That's where we've got some bias. That's where we've got some barriers. And that's what we need to target. So it really is a much more, you know, results-oriented profit-focused approach than I think what's been done in the past. And you know, what was really interesting for me in working with you guys on this book and editing it is that you, you took a lot of stories, um, uh, success stories and not so success stories from the work that you've done and you integrate those into the narrative. So there's a lot of, um, well, it's not a theoretical book. It's a very practical book about you know, here's some, here's some specific situation, mindsets, assumptions, ways of looking at, at the world that both men and women typically have. Here's, here's examples of how that had a real impact in the workplace or in any organization. And here's what to do about it. And I, I, I think that that's great. Because, you know, you really feel when you read this book that you're reading a book by people that have done the work on the ground and understand mm -hmm. things. And, and it's interesting that you both say about how this is still such an issue and hasn't really changed much in the last 10 or 15 years because, you know, I think there is a general misperception out there that yeah. things have improved over those years. And really, certain progress has been made in certain areas, but then there's been stasis as well. And the challenge is as much amongst women's mindsets as it is amongst men's, which is why you have this very, very broad audience base, um, you know, not only in the consulting work that you do, but also um, in the book itself. Um, and I like to, the way that you arrange the book, you've got your, you know, three, you know, main concepts. You've got, you know, like a mindset, what, what you call a mindset shift. Then you've got skill set development once you've made that shift. 
Um, and then you've got environment and process change. And I know those are kind of, you know, high level terms, Jody, but maybe you talk a little bit about that segmented approach to, um, you know, to, to, to solving the challenge of, of gender equity. Yeah, I think what's interesting is that when you look at this problem, it's a systems problem. And I think so many organizations want to slice and dice it. Okay, let, like Kelly was saying, let's go train these people and we're done. You know, mm -hmm. let L&D take care of it. And I think the problem is, is when you have a systems problem, it requires a, a multitude of processes and approaches. Mm -hmm. So when you think about mindset, it's really about shifting the mindset about the organization. I'll give you a perfect example. A lot of organizations call themselves meritocracies. And so when you put a patina of merit on an organization, what it actually does is hides the bias because there's this assumption that everybody who has made it through the pipeline is meritorious, right? Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I don't have to question whether or not they're competent. They are competent. And so therefore, even though who makes it to the top doesn't look like anything like who's at the bottom, I still think that it's meritorious. So mindset shift means I have to shift that and think, oh, well, if I don't have, if the senior leadership doesn't reflect what my organization looks like, it can't be meritorious. I've got to think about what that looks like. So my, that's a mindset shift. I have to say, oh, we, we need to think about this differently. Another example on a mindset shift is that I've been talking to a lot of organizations and they're thinking, they're not sure, they're hesitant. Should we do this? Should we not? And we're saying, well, another way you need to think about this is that from a competitive perspective, the millennials and Gen Zs are A, much more diverse and B, want to work in a diverse organization. And so if you think about this from a mindset perspective, how important it is for your talent pipeline, wow, I need to have the desire and the need to think about it. I also need to be able to look underneath the covers and say, what are all the assumptions that we've been making in our organization and think differently about us? But that's just one component. Mm -hmm. The second component is this idea of skill set. And with skill set, we really want to think about the diversity, the inclusion, the voice, the synergy. This is our taxonomy. And we basically say that when we did a survey last year, uh, with a, a, a bunch of different people who were looking at allyship, we found that only 21% of senior leaders had ever been trained mm -hmm. in inclusion. So we're out there, everybody's out there going, oh, you need to be inclusive, and yet nobody has the skills. Well, how the heck are they supposed to do the work if they don't have the skills? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that you can't go, you can't sit there and move straight to synergy where you're building all this collaborative and bringing in everybody's ideas unless you really understand that, that you know, People think differently and people have different backgrounds and you need to understand that they're going to come to the table with different ways of looking at things, which is actually a powerful skill. And we're not looking at it as a skill. So that's the second component. And then the third component is exactly what Kelly was talking about, this idea of environmental and process change. So environmental means you've got to give people the, the safety to be able to make mistakes. So we did a seminar a couple weeks ago on unconscious bias for across an organization and people ask some very raw questions. They asked the raw questions because they wanted to know the answers. And they were, they were afraid previously to do it, but because we created the psychologically safe environment, they felt like they could. And so that is the environment that you want to people to be able to do. So if you have a senior leader who doesn't understand that, you know, in COVID, women are struggling to do everything, we can unpack that in a little bit, but, we have to give them the opportunity to learn that without judging them. And then, of course, you've got to change the processes. I like to, to think about this is that when you think about how processes were designed, they were designed in a 1950s environment mm -hmm. where it was predominantly white men in senior power. Mm -hmm. And it's still like that. You know, we still have the legacy, you know, six, 60 years later, 70 years later. We need to unpack what's going on and say, how do we think differently about the processes? Because the processes are how people get things done and make decisions without thinking, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's routine, it's habit. So what you need to do is you need to redesign them or rethink them or adapt them so that it's easy for people to not be biased. Yeah. And that's the idea. So that's why we do the mindset, the skill set and then the environment process. It's a systemic challenge and we approach it from a systemic perspective. And it's very systemically presented in the book as well in, in the three different parts. And it also, uh, the book has a very, um, uh, a comprehensive collection of appendices that give people additional material, additional tools. You talked about the, the scorecard, Kelly, that's in there. You've got different matrices. You've got mind mapping. You've got a whole range of things, it's a, it, which I think add 
to, to, to the practical value of what the book presents. I'd like to come back to this uh, notion of unconscious bias because it's such an important concept in the book and <clears throat> it seems to be it's such an important concept to our culture in general. And I think of books like, you know, Can Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, which I know you reference and <clears throat> so many other recent publications are starting to develop a sophistication of understanding around how we operate and how we bring our pasts and our assumptions to bear on everything that we do. And I think that's a really critical part of what you guys do. And, and, and maybe Kelly, you could talk a little bit about, you know, about unconscious bias and flawed assumptions and how these issues really impact gender equity, you know, within organizations in general. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's, um, it's a really important topic right now. And um, a lot of companies, the approach they've taken is well, if we understand unconscious bias, then it goes away and, and it will stop. And it's interesting because um, I'm working on a doctorate right now. And so I'm doing a lot of, you know, back to the really deep core research that's been done. And, you know, this bias research, Kahneman started his work in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And there's been work even from before that showing how the brain works and where unconscious bias comes from. And so the, the reality is we've known that the brain operates this way for a really long time and it hasn't changed it. You know, we know that in, in this environment, for example, you know, there's a lot of confirmation bias that we, we read things that we already agree with and that confirms what we agree with. And so we, it, it sort of gets us to double down on our thinking. And so, so leaving the whole story at um, training about unconscious bias really doesn't get there. You have to do the next step. And so we really did a lot of work in the um, cognitive behavioral therapy world where we understand not only do you have to identify the basis of your, of your bias, your, your flawed assumptions, right? The stuff that's underlying your decision making unconsciously and, and identify what that is. Then we have to decide, we have to actually make a choice. Is, is that flawed? Is it an assumption that I agree with? In which case, carry on with the same behavior. Or is it something that I can pick up and look at from all angles and say, you know what, I don't actually agree with this assumption. This assumption's flawed. Now I get to change my behavior because I get to rewrite the rule and, and change the assumption. Mm -hmm. So we encourage, you know, Jody talked about the um, mindset skill set learning environment, and really a big part of this is reframing the assumptions. We encourage women to reframe their assumptions about gender and, and this um, outdated sort of stereotype about gender and what, what gender means when you're talking about workplace skills. You know, we, we like to think, we, we like to um, draw a picture of, you know, women as, as being strong in certain traits because of their gender. And we, we do the same for men, right? And, and it's all made up, you know, and we, we have, my favorite part of the book actually is the whole section where we sort of turn this whole thing on its ear and show how completely made up it is. And the reason we know it's made up is because it changes over time, right? You know, you think about when women were arguing for the vote, they were having to overcome a belief that women can't vote because they can't be logical. Their brains somehow are hysterical and not logical. They're too emotional. And, and we've overcome that and we realized that, you know, women can vote and women actually make a, a massive difference in how, in things that are voted and, and how voting happens. And then we look, you know, I, my, one of my favorites is the marathon, right? In, mm. in the 70s, we decided that women physically couldn't run a marathon. And there were all kinds of scientists that believed this, right? Not based mm. on any studies or anything, but just, you know, women can't mm. run marathons. And we need, to, we need to grab them and pull them out of a marathon if they pretend to, to be like men and run a Which marathon. Which they did do in Boston. <laughs> we did do in Boston, as you know. And, you know, it, it seems absurd now. More women run marathons than men on an annual mm. basis now. And, and uh, you know, I've run four. I haven't had any negative physical effects from, you know, mm. running a marathon. In fact, I think it probably is what keeps me alive. So, right. so you, you look at that and you realize how absurd it is. Well, now put that layer on some of the things we attribute to women now. And, and it's equally absurd to think that all, well, all women leaders are more, you know, in touch with, 
their emotions are in touch with, you know, are, are nurturing and, and all mm -hmm. of this stuff that's attributed. And, and I think part of it is neither Jody or I could, could be accused of being nurturing. <laughs> so we already violate a lot of gender stereotypes ourselves, and which I think gave us the ability to look at it with a more critical lens and say, is this real? Is this, are, are these rules real? Um, well, that's, we a, that's, a, a, that's a different kind of nurturing. You're nurturing, um, you're nurturing <laughs> all of us in helping us to it, understand what our flawed assumptions are and what we can do about it. Uh, that's how right, I would. And exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And then once you reframe, the cool thing about the reframe too, and we ask, you know, women to reframe, we ask men to reframe and organizations themselves to reframe some of these policies that, uh, mm -hmm. that Jody was talking about. But the, the magical thing about the reframe is when you are stuck with the old rule, you tend to get into this either or, you know, you can only do this or this. There only tends to be two options. Mm -hmm. But when you reframe and throw away the rule, all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch more options that open up to you. And there's a whole bunch of more empowerment that happens because now you get to choose. Now it's not, well, my choice is limited to I can either have a robust career or I can have a family. And, and mm -hmm. you know, it's this teeter-totter of balance. It's now, oh, wait a minute. Um, I'm, I'm actually entitled to have a, a great career and we're all responsible for, the, for, for making the family piece work. Well, now you get to throw away the mom has to be the one that packs the lunch and mom has to be the one that does the homework and mom has to be the one that packs the sweater, or, you know, whatever. It's, well, they're his kids too. And he wants to have a robust career too. So, wow, you mean we get to order a meal service? You mean we get to have a driver? You know, because like neither one of us needs to drive the kids, right? We, we both can say, well, that's not a task that the parent has to do. We can be involved and not have to drive to every single soccer practice. So, so it just, it's, it's that part of it that I think is the most fun for us. And the more we, we practice this model and reframe, the more really fabulous solutions kind of come out of it. Well, I love the concept of reframe and it's really, the, it's at the core of the book. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that, you're, that, that you've been emphasizing it that way. I also love that it's a very positive message. And I think you know, as a man coming to this material and working on it with you guys, I really liked the fact that men could read this book, learn from it, and not feel in any way defensive. There's no need to feel defensive because really it's about organizational, personal and organizational success that's win-win for everybody. It's win for women, for men, and for those organizations to put into practice. And you have so many examples of that that I think it works really well. Another interesting uh, thing about the book for me was that, you know, when you guys started it and we began working on it, um, it was very much about what everybody within the organization needs to do and then what the organization needs to do. And then gradually I began to realize, you know, that's all true, but this is also a book about leadership. This is really, um, you know, because it, it's, it's a cumulative thing. And it's, you know, you can't start with something that's so fundamentally important to any organization and talk about altering it without really talking about leadership. And, you know, I, and a lot of your arguments circle, circle back to leadership. And Jody, maybe you could talk a little bit about how that concept is, you know, in your minds as authors in the book or in your minds as, you know, consultants when you're working with organizations. Yeah. I think first off, everything that we talk about, we consider 21st century leadership. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the organizations today, they are hugely diverse, hugely diverse. And so if you have leaders who don't understand how to create an inclusive organization because they've never been taught the skills, mm -hmm. that's something missing, right? They don't have the full, uh, com the full range of leadership skills that are available to them. Another thing that happens is, is that we don't measure this. So therefore, we don't know that there's a gap in leadership skills because what we've been measuring in terms of skill sets are not necessarily what we need for the 21st century. We're still back, you know, in the 20th century measuring skills that matter. Right? Do Can you do the financial bottom line? Yes, you need to do the financial bottom line, but you also, and you also need to figure out how to do inclusive teams. You know, the days of the dictator top-down leadership have been gone for 40 years, and yet there's still organizations who are just like, 
this is what we're going to do in a very rigid way. That's not really 21st century leadership. You can't really compete very effectively with that type of approach. So mm -hmm. everything about our book talks about this idea of what it means to be a leader today. Mm -hmm. And we believe that being an inclusive leader is fundamental to that. It shouldn't be separate. Like a lot of organizations separated out, oh, let's do our DNI over here. And really what we're saying is no, it should be fundamental and part of your core process, your, poor, your core um, group of, of building skill sets within your leadership development, the whole area. I think that what happens with, with uh, diversity and inclusion work is that people are uncomfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot easier to go put it over here in this mm -hmm. special area and not really touch it. Mm -hmm. Kelly and I both come from these operational business backgrounds. Both of us had P&L responsibility. Both of us look at this as this is just one more strategy that you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so as a leader, your job is to implement strategy. Is your mm -hmm. job is to make your organization more effectively. This is a strategy just like any other. Come up with a strategic vision, figure out your gap, implement the gap do the change management, there you go. It's no different than any other strategic plan. For us, it's like the same, business is business is business. And it puts gender equity at the core of the business right. and it makes it hard. Well, it, what you're doing is you're teaching people that you can't ignore it or you can't, right. it, it's, not a, it's not an HR problem or a learning and development problem, it's right. a business problem. It's a business and problem. I think that's a, uh, that's a great message for um, um, for anybody that works within any organization. And again, you know, we're talking about, you know, nonprofits as well as for-profit businesses. We're talking about schools and colleges, um, any group of people that, you know, need to get, come together, set, create a set of goals and achieve them. And, uh, you know, 21st century leadership has shown us that we live in a world where if you don't have those inclusivity skills, you're going to be left behind as an organization. So really the, you know, the, the, the punishment, if you like, for not doing this is not that you're going to get your hand slapped for not being a good boy, it's that you're making the organization suffer because you're not doing something that really is good, you know, good for the bottom line or good for the organization's goals, you know? And Kevin, if I just may add to that, because one of the things that is pretty, is, we're starting to see really clearly is that there are a lot of top organizations that mm -hmm. are pushing ahead on this and have already mm -hmm. started implementing this and moving forward and building inclusion. So it takes three to five years to really think about how to redesign and, and get rid of all the bias that's in, so deeply embedded. Mm -hmm. So what we always tell companies is that, all right, it's going to take you three to five years to do this. Mm -hmm. And every day you wake, your competitors are now ahead. So not only are you three to five years behind, but you're also behind however long it is your, your competitors have been working on this. It, the gap starts to grow. Now you are way behind. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty clear in our book that we're saying, this is a business imperative, your choice. But if you want to compete, I wouldn't sit on the sidelines because there's not that much time. And we're seeing that day by day in the publishing business, for example. Mm. And, you know, it's historically a not as diverse industry as it should be. Uh, people are starting to realize that. Um, the publishing industry has made significant strides in publishing books by people of color, but not by creating leadership roles for people of color, for example, you know. Um, mm. uh, we're now seeing the appointment of high level diversity and inclusivity uh, roles within publishing organizations. And that's just, that's the industry I'm in, but I know that that's, that's we're, we're beginning to see that across the board, thanks to the work of, of, of people like yourselves. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to go back to this, you know, the tone of the book, uh, again, I think the positive tone is so good. Uh, it's not aimed at shaming or disparaging. It's not aimed at putting people back on their heels, whether it's men or women, but it's really about just making organizations better places to work. Um, what kind of responses, Kelly, do you get from the men and women that you work with in your consulting work, uh, work uh, in this respect? I mean, I imagine that sometimes you have engagements where people are coming into your workshops not really knowing what to expect. And I'm just curious about, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of, what kind of tone you know, you get from those people. Yeah, there's a lot of people who are frightened, especially right now, of making mistakes and, and um, 
you know, they, they, they don't want to stumble in an area. It's, it's kind of one of those areas where, unfortunately, without psychological safety, we haven't given people the space to learn. And that's why what Jody was saying about psychological safety is so important. And we create that right off the top in our workshops. Um, so the response we usually get is relief um, because we start off very quickly establishing the lack of blame for the situation. And, and here's, here's one of the approaches I like to take is, first of all, this bias thing, right? It's, there's two pieces to it. The first is that our brains just work this way. And we've known this for, you know, 40, 50 years now that our brains don't make rational decisions. Contrary to, to what we've all been raised to believe, our brains don't make rational decisions. We're full of, there, there's probably hundreds of different types of biased decision-making that our brains make. So our brains, and you know, and, and you referenced Kahneman. So Kahneman talked about there's the, the bias stuff that happens in the thinking fast. When you think quickly, and that's sometimes as a matter of survival, you need to be able to think quickly, and your brain uses a lot of shortcuts to do that, and, and that's where the bias comes in. But then there's the opportunity to, to slow it down and to make more um, conscious decision making. And that's the decision making that, you know, we have an opportunity in to, to interrupt bias, okay? So we've got this brain that's doing this stuff. And unfortunately, we often use the system one thinking for important decisions like mm -hmm. hiring people um, where we really should be slowing down into, into number two. So that, that's number one. It's not your fault. It's how the brain works. Um, the second piece that's really important is that the narrative of our biases has been formed over our lifetime up till now. So if you were raised, you know, if, if you're a white male who, you know, went to school and maybe accounting or engineering was surrounded by only other males and then got into leadership that was a bunch of males and the only women you came in contact with were, you know, your secretary or somebody who, you know, your flight attendant, um, your perspective on women is formed by that narrative, right? Mm -hmm. It's not your fault up until now, up until today. Not until you read the you book. <laughs> right, until, until today. So, so the stuff that you brought with you is not your fault. And so your narrative is necessarily 100% formed by all those experiences and reinforced in the media and reinforced by the books you read to your point about authors of color. And you know, if, if that's the bubble you've lived in, that is the narrative of your bias, right? Yeah. So what, that, what a relief. To be able to say that stuff's not my fault because I didn't know until today. Now the responsibility going forward is number one: you now know that there's two ways to make decisions, and one is to use the bias thinking, the system one, and the other is to be more conscious. So we can train that, and that is our reframe model and how to do that. The second thing is you can 100% control the narrative of your biases going forward by expanding your narrative, by getting out there and being willing to accept new information. So working with professional women, you know, is a great way of doing that. And bringing in some people of color to your leadership team is a great way to do that because now you get counter stereotype information that mm -hmm. you didn't have before. And you're able to therefore move forward with a new narrative. And so, you know, how can you feel um, stressed in that environment? In that environment is 100% under your control now and not your fault, not something, you know, that, that anybody can fairly blame you for. And if we create an environment, which we do in our context of being able to make an honest mistake and then learn and grow from that mistake, then there's no, then, then there's just relief, right? Now yeah. we have a space to learn. Yeah, no, that's great. And, uh, uh, and, and really you take that, you take that approach and that philosophy from the consulting work you do, and you really do bring it into this book. Um, I think maybe a good way to finish off today would be to kind of like bring it right up to date and talk a little bit about COVID and this very strange world that we're in. I mean, here we are uh, taking part in a virtual conference. I know that this time last year, Don and I were down at Cambridge Public Library and there was a, you know, a theater and people came in and there were booths and everything. And now all of a sudden that's all virtual. So we're all, you know, dealing with this new reality. Um, to what extent, uh, I know that you, you include a section in the book on COVID, which is great because it really brings the book right up till the present. But maybe you guys could talk a little bit about how you see uh, this crisis affecting, number one, attitudes, number two, uh, you know, workplace habits, and number three, the kinds of 
you know, things like reframing and other things that people need to do to, uh, to adjust to the world? Maybe, Joe, to begin with you. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that is, is a discouraging side of it is, is that with the pandemic, A, a lot of women's jobs have gone totally gone because a lot of where women were clustered in work, such as in events, those jobs don't exist right now. So they've lost their jobs. So you have this she, the she session. But the other piece that actually makes me really sad too is that everybody's at home and all of this home work, so to speak, has fallen predominantly on female shoulders. And this comes down to these gender stereotypes, like women's job is to work at home and men's job is to go work money. And so even though they're all at home, the women's the one, the women are the one doing the homeschooling. Like, why? We need to reframe that. We need to think differently and challenge that assumption, which would give freedom to the, the women and the men. And, and they need to work together to renegotiate what that could look like. We're in a new era and people are going back to stereotypes and behaviors that have lasted for centuries. Why? It seems kind of silly to solve that problem with an old answer. Whereas, you know, at work, we've solved this problem with a brand new answer. We've actually used Zoom. Everybody uses Zoom. And it's just become this, it's become ubiquitous. And it's become a new way of thinking about work. And now people are actually thinking about how to restructure work. Do we really need to be working seven, five days a week on site? And there's a lot of creativity. And yet you still have, you know, the CEO of Netflix going, everybody needs back to be back at work 100%. Well, why? Why are we going back to these old, rigid ways of thinking, whether they're gender stereotypes or ways of working? We have this opportunity with COVID to really challenge these. We've been talking to a lot of organizations and saying, look, the changes that are required to become more inclusive are dis disruptive, right? You, you have to create change, and change is always disruptive. Well, COVID did this beautiful thing for you. It created the disruption. So everybody can be upset with COVID, and then you can reform and change the way you operate in new forms without the pain of change. Like, it's incredible opportunity. And I can't tell you, there's some organizations that are taking advantage of it, and then there's others that are just like, we, there was an organization that, that I heard about that was basically like, child care is not our problem, it's up to you. Well, yeah. haven't we just learned that childcare is everybody's problem and the schools have dropped the ball? It's just, to me, it's shocking at how ill-equipped people have been to actually creatively manage this disruption in a way that we could actually create a better way to work. Yeah. COVID is an opportunity, and I don't see the majority of organizations taking advantage of it, and it has gender implications, seriously. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Kelly, any further thoughts on, on that? I mean, uh, by the way, are, are, is so has soccer been uh, completely <laughs> stopped at the moment? Is, is you know, is it is? is yes, is I have been, not refereed a soccer game in months, and I have not. Yeah, it's, I'm sure you miss that. I miss that. Actually, I miss getting Austin, there. we're we're having soccer here. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah, mm. yeah. We have the club practices. They have club practices, but they're not the same, and we haven't had games. Oh, right, so right. so they, they're encouraging us to keep up our certifications and to stay healthy because I think that's part of the other issue is that a lot of people haven't been out exercising. So um, it'll be interesting when it comes back. And, and there again, you know, Jody has a great point about COVID being this catalyst. Is this an opportunity to redesign how we do a lot of things? And, you know, one of the things that I haven't missed since soccer is not happening is the disruption in our lives and in our children's lives. Um, so the, the good parts of soccer are missing, but the bad parts we're not missing so much. And so it's an opportunity to really rethink how we schedule, how often the games are happening, how much training has to go into kids playing soccer, which is supposed to be, you know, athletics and not their career, right? Right. So um, I know that my kids are getting a lot more homework done since soccer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking that's maybe not a bad thing. Um, so, so yeah, it's, I, I think there's a big opportunity here. And, and one of the things I wanted to tack on to what Jody said about COVID is that we've heard this sort of narrative in the media about it being um, women being victims of COVID. And I really think that anytime we reinforce that narrative, we're kind of, we're tapping back into the old instead of looking at it as this is a massive opportunity for women. Because if women push back and, and request that the narrative change on whose responsibility it is to help these kids with their schoolwork and, and figure out, you know, childcare during COVID, if they push back and make it the men's problem, the world mm -hmm. will change. 
And this is the thing, we have continued to shelter um, everyone else. We've taken it on because the world has said here and dumped it on us. And we've said, oh, okay, let me pick that up too. Instead of saying, well, wait a minute, let, let's, I'm not going to pick that up. What happens if I don't pick that up? And I would love to see a revolution happen right now where we just say enough. That yeah. It's time that we as a society really look at how we're going to manage robust and exciting and interesting careers that we need because we need people working right now for sure, right? Mm -hmm. And how to manage that with this other um, piece that's really important, which is how we raise and, and educate our children. Yeah. So I yeah. think it's a massive opportunity and we need to start framing it as it's time to get all the bodies to the table and have this conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, those all great points, both of you. And uh, I wanna thank you. I know you're both really busy people and I wanna thank you for taking the time today to share some of your thoughts you. about the next smart step and about the work that you do, the great work that you do. And, um, you know, uh, we're all hopeful for the book uh, and, and uh, delighted that it's out there and looking forward to the print version in February. So, you know, um, thanks again for, Thank you. for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.